Um, so I now have the great pleasure of uh, welcoming back to CSAS uh, two old friends and actual, actually they're four of my former bosses up here because I've actually, these two uh, guests have been my boss twice um, each. So uh, it's a little intimidating for me to have a little empathy as I sit up here. Um, but everything I know, I learned from them. So um, we'll be I, doing your performance appraisal later on. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's I've right. already done that. Um, so uh, everybody knows uh, these two uh, people, but I'm going to go ahead and do the formalities. Caroline Atkinson is the um, special assistant to the president and uh, deputy national security advisor for international economics. Uh, and in that capacity, among many other things she does, she is the G20 Sherpa. Uh, and since we actually, I don't think, defined Sherpa before, just for the record, uh, the Sherpa is the uh, person, the presidents, or the heads of, head of governments, personal representative to the G20 who helps uh, get the leader to and up the summit. Ha ha. Um, with so a yak. With, well. with a yak, which I was to, uh, to uh, another, at another time. Uh, so, um, Caroline. And then on my right, your left, is David Lipton, who is the first Deputy Managing Director at the IMF. Uh, he was just telling me he's been there three years, which I can't believe because uh, time flies. Um, also previously served, like Caroline, at the U.S. Treasury and the White House um, in a number of senior roles. And uh, it's just a terrific pair to have here to talk about uh, how one gets ready for these summits and what the uh, substantive agenda is and uh, we're trying to give the real uh, uh, flesh of, of why this G20 actually matters. So we're gonna have a little conversation, then I will open it up for uh, questions from all of you. Let me start uh, with David. Uh, you, this week, the IMF released its uh, semi-annual World Economic Outlook, or WIO, as it's known in the trade. Uh, and you talk at the beginning about an uneven recovery in the world uh, economy continuing. Uh, your boss, uh, Madame Lagarde, talked the other day about a new mediocre for growth, and there have been people talking about secular stagnation. There are a lot of sort of buzz phrases out there. Uh, what is the outlook? Why is it not quite as happy an outlook as, as uh, one would hope or expect? Um, you know, is the problem on the supply side, is it on the demand side, is it both? Um, and what can the G20 uh, contribute to making it better? Sure. First, let me say thanks uh, for having me here today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back. I think that the uh, new mediocre phrase, while simple, uh, captures a lot of what we think about the present situation. We're, you know, this year's growth has been somewhat disappointing and below our forecasts. We're projecting that next year, in 2015, growth will be 3.8%. To put it in perspective, growth in the 25 years before the global financial crisis was 3.8%. Uh, so, and we know that towards the end of that period, there were several years where uh, growth was, we believe, unsustainably high in some advanced economies, and that was part of the buildup to crisis. So at one level, the, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about recovery, but we're concerned about the situation because we believe that growth could be higher and we're worried that growth may be worse. And let me say what I mean by that, that uh, we've seen uh, advanced economies slowing down and under, the US is doing well, the UK has, has been now recovering strongly, but we see uh, parts of the advanced world, especially in Europe, but also in Japan growing uh, too slowly. And we see in the emerging market world, countries gro growing more slowly than they were and we also believe uh, not living up to their uh, potential. We see potential growth falling and believe that steps will have to be taken for countries to raise their, uh, their potential growth. We also worry that things could be worse. There are quite a number of risks out there in the global economy and, in, uh, in, in, and more generally. Uh, there's a risk that uh, Europe is not on the baseline. We have, uh, our baseline is for recovery uh, to above, uh, to 1.3% to growth next year in Europe, but there's a risk that the lowflation uh, and um, uh, uh, lack of investment leads to uh, very slow growth in Europe. Uh, there's a risk that EM countries continue to slow down. Excuse me. 
there are a number of geopolitical risks, uh, which I'm sure you're all aware, the Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict, various conflicts in the Middle East, uh, in, in Africa, the Ebola uh, epidemic, which uh, we calculate that if it were to spread, it would be uh, very significant. Um, and we've identified in our the other paper we published uh, this week and that was just unveiled today, the Global Financial Stability Report, a range of financial risks that come from the two processes that there's unconventional monetary policy very forceful, lowering interest rates, lowering financial volatility, uh, and a new, uh, very large non-bank financial sector emerging uh, where uh, uh, bets are being placed and financial investments are taking place. And it may be that uh, there is a reach for yield and some risk taking that could be problematic. So we see this uh, situation as a, a, a decent baseline, but one where uh, an effort should be made to strengthen growth because it will lower all of these vulnerabilities. And I think that's where the G20 comes in. Uh, the G20 this year is attempting to, uh, among other things, emphasize growth and together uh, pledge to take measures that would raise global GDP by 2% over a five-year period. When this was announced uh, as, a, as a, an initiative, I think it was... Uh, treated with a certain dismissiveness, but the G20 countries have now put forward quite a, a large number of measures. We in the OECD have looked at them. We believe that these measures are significant enough that if they were taken, they would have uh, this kind of effect on GDP. Of course, these are just pledges, and so the next phase, the next step will be for all of these um, measures to be implemented, and that's something that uh, uh, G20 countries have to endeavor to, to uh, uh, be accountable for. We'll help in the monitoring of that. We in our work with the G20 have stressed that support for growth really has to have uh, three components. Strengthening demand where there's uh, slack in the economy and there are important parts of the globe where there is slack. Uh, taking structural measures to boost uh, potential GDP over time, and rebalancing uh, where that can play a role, where current account surpluses need to be reduced in order to facilitate uh, current account deficits being reduced without adverse effects on the global economy. Uh, we put emphasis on all three of these. Uh, we're not saying to just do one or another. We are, we are, however, put, uh, spending a, a special effort on one area that the G20 is paying attention to, which is infrastructure. There's been work in the last two presidencies of the G20 to emphasize the, the role that infrastructure can play to look at whether the um, uh, lack of infrastructure investment comes from a lack of finance, a lack of projects, other factors. We've looked at this subject in the third chapter of the World Economic Outlook, which I recommend to you, it makes the important point that uh, infrastructure investments can have a very significant and prolonged effect on output, especially when countries have slack, when the spending, the demand side, infrastructure uh, investments have two effects. They, they raise demand, but they also, by creating um, public capital raise supply, but where the, there's slack, the demand effect may be particularly substantial and, pr and protracted. And this, we find, will have the tendency in, in many circumstances actually to lower debt to GDP ratios because the help for GDP growth more than offsets the uh, debt that's incurred in order to undertake the infrastructure. Uh, I think this uh, is a an important subject, one that feeds very much into the G20's work and is supportive of that. Great, excellent. I want to follow up on, on that point in particular, but um, let me turn to Caroline first and ask you some, essentially the same question. What's your view of the world and the, the global economic outlook, and what, do you, what are your hopes and expectations for Brisbane and, and the G20's contribution to uh, global growth? Well, first of all, uh, thank you for, for having me here, and also thank you to David 
for extremely good analysis, even if it is a bit uh, concerning, that is being published uh, this week and, and last week. On the, the first and foremost discussion at the G20 this year, as, uh, as is typical, but I think with a little bit more of an edge uh, than there has been recently, will be around growth and jobs. Because um, it's clear that we have been disappointed globally over a number of years by a failure quite to meet expectations. David talked about downside risks. Uh, and those have mostly materialized over the past. Not, in, uh, not most recently, and I'm glad to say not in the United <coughs> States. But we see that um, the effects of the global financial crisis have still not been fully worked through in some areas. Uh, we in the United States did move quickly, and that was when David was at the White House and I was not, to put in place programs to uh, build infrastructure and help to support jobs <coughs> and growth, and at the same time to uh, review the financial system and make very important reforms there. And I think that is partly why we've now had uh, you know, more than 10 million jobs created in the private sector over the last four or five years. And uh, we are on a path to recovery, although we still have work to do. But if we look around the world, uh, especially, I'm sorry to say, in uh, Europe, there is still a big problem of, uh, of slow growth. And we believe that uh, whilst it's important to uh, take measures to boost productivity and supply and, and address longer term issues, the uh, most immediate issue is the shortfall in global demand. And I think that the timing of the G20 summit, as David said earlier this year, people may not quite have taken seriously the Australian push for identification of measures to add to growth. And there was maybe a little bit more optimism about the underlying path earlier this year. But uh, I just came back from a meeting in Australia of Sherpas. And there's clearly concern, even before we saw the IMF forecasts, about how we can make sure that the whole world is able to lift up and move forward on growth. So, the big first push has to be about the further work that needs to be done, must be done, to support growth. I completely support uh, David's points on infrastructure. The president has talked about the infrastructure <coughs> deficit here in the United States. That's something that has resonance in, uh, in many other G20 countries. And there are a lot of elements that need to come right where we've been working on those providing the financing, there's finding the appropriate projects. There's bringing those two together. And, uh, and there is also the role for public as well as private, and private as well as public in infrastructure building. And I think this new paper uh, that shows what a good investment it is for countries to make uh, by rebuilding and improving and modernizing infrastructure is, uh, carries a very important lesson because it's a way that you can actually uh, move forward and marry the debate about demand and supply as it uh, implicates both sides of, uh, of, of that balance. And David also pointed to, to rebalance. That was one of the issues that we talked about a lot, global imbalances, a, a few years ago. And the sort of some of those global imbalances have been reduced, but there is a growing imbalance again with Europe as it has moved into current account surplus as an area, um, partly because the deficit countries in the periphery have constricted their economies. And the surplus countries in the core have maintained their surpluses. Uh, so that's Germany, the Netherlands, and so on, where there is certainly scope for more uh, investment and uh, which we think will help more even and balanced growth going forward. Now, apart from that part of the agenda, there are some other specific areas that we are, where we're hoping to make progress. One is, um, and I've talked about this before, but it's about labor force participation. And the G20 also has meetings of employment ministers. 
And one thing we've been pushing in that we, the United States, have worked on with a number of other countries is on female labor force participation, which is, and again, the IMF did some great work earlier about the loss to everybody um, in terms of lost GDP when women don't work out of the inability to find childcare or the lack of opportunities for uh, paid employment and for formal sector employment, which is an important issue in some countries. So we've been working on, uh, on that area and hope to make some progress. Another important area, huge area which connects to uh, the infrastructure is on climate and energy. Because obviously, uh, as extreme weather events have, um, have become more frequent, as the next key date in the international negotiations on climate, which is uh, December 2015, comes closer, there is more of a focus uh, amongst leaders, certainly our leader, but there was a UN summit on uh, climate uh, last week or whenever it was in New York. Uh, and part of the issue about climate is capitalizing on investment opportunities to put in place the kind of low carbon green economy that we need. So this is very importantly linked with uh, infrastructure and with spreading uh, energy efficiency, clean energy. And uh, we expect leaders will have a discussion about that. Another important issue of course is trade uh, where we in the United States continue to work on a number of trade uh, agreements which are aimed at raising standards around the world. Um, but there are also, can be problems in, uh, uh, or there's a question about how we can make progress in the multilateral system. And um, there is, uh, then there's the whole sort of international, do, ha, which institutions do we use? We believe that the G20 is exactly the right group to be getting around the table. We need to have uh, emerging market economies, the big economies around the table talking about all of these issues together. Uh, we also know that the IMF is a very important institution, and as I believe uh, Jack Lou said yesterday at another uh, event, it is critical, we know, in the United States to get IMF reform legislation passed. This is something that, uh, that has uh, almost made it through Congress, where the US was leading a few years ago and has not, David was polite enough not to mention it, but it is an important it's okay, I'm going to ask him about it. Um, okay. <laughs> it is uh, very important. We're working very hard, um, but it, it's important that Congress should, should move on this. So. Okay. Well, you've anticipated a lot of the things I wanted to talk about. I mean, first of all, just looking back at the communiques um, over the last several summits, it really is striking how there was a, a real discussion when I was doing this about fiscal consolidation, and, and that was the main, I think well, there's a big debate about austerity versus st stimulus, and it seems now that the clear focus is on, on, on growth and, and, uh, and, and you know, working both on demand and supply um, conditions to, uh, uh, to, to, to keep growth um, strong. So I think that um, is a very interesting sort of uh, uh, transition that you both uh, touched on. on the, on, on, the, um, on the infrastructure question, so just who, who's gonna pay for this or who should pay for all this? Because uh, you know, the numbers that, that are out there for infrastructure gaps, it doesn't matter which number I cite, but it's in the trillions. And once you get up in the trillions, it's, 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 it's large numbers. And, and that's not trivial amounts of money. And the private sector in theory has you know, tens of trillions uh, to invest, uh, but is that the, is that, who's gonna end up paying for most of this? Should they pay for it? Do governments still have an important role here um, in infrastructure investment? Well, let's, I mean, start with, starting with the macro. Investment in the world is low. It's low by historic standards. Public capital stocks have been coming down in advanced economies relative to GDP. This is all uh, discussed and, and laid out in the paper that I referred to. Obviously, there's enough savings in the world to be funding more investment. Uh, and that would be all the more the case if an infrastructure push uh, raised global growth and created uh, a sustaining basis for uh, that investment. 
I do think we, there is a tendency to speak about this, uh, it's become very popular to speak about this subject in terms of the growing role of the private sector, to talk about public-private partnerships, and in a sense to blend together the subject of infrastructure and the subject of privatization. But I do think we should step back, take a look at infrastructure generally. If you look at the pie of all infrastructure spending, 35, 40% of it is what you think of as build as uh, highways and ports and uh, physical infrastructure. And the rest is social infrastructure, schools and hospitals, uh, defense and other things. Now clearly there is a public role. There, there, there are things that the public sector, public goods theory tells us there are things the public sector has to do and that it doesn't make sense to charge for. There is clearly a, a room for a lot more, a, a lot bigger role for the private sector. But I think it's important to look across the entire spectrum of infrastructure, see what the needs are, see where public capital has uh, eroded or depreciated, where more would be valuable, where there's slack and, in essence, the physical resources to uh, build it, where uh, the financing cost would be very low because of the availability of uh, funding and the low interest rates that governments face. I think there's ample room uh, uh, for this in some countries. Uh, we're not suggesting that it's uh, going to work, uh, or going to have a place uh, everywhere, but we think that there's a lot of room for it. Okay. Uh, two things that you touched on that are contributors to growth are um, trade and, and womenomics. We did a big event on womenomics a couple weeks ago in Japan and, and uh, focused very much on the economic imperative there of closing that participation gap. The numbers for which are very powerful and numbers yeah. of additional workforce uh, participants, women, and uh, the, the productivity gains that you'd get from that. Um, and I just note, I won't ask you to follow up because you've already made the point, but the employment ministers in the G20 did set a kind of semi-target for um, closing that participation gap by 25% by 2025, which is ambitious but would have a very powerful impact. Um, on, on trade, um, uh, what, what, what can the G20, I mean the G20 to date has really done two things. One is to, uh, is to agree and extend the standstill on protectionism, which is, you know, much maligned or it's, it's been violated in the, in the, um, in the specific uh, measures that people have taken. But in the broad sense, it's actually been helpful in, in holding back a tide of protectionism. And then it sort of tried to support the multilateral uh, trading regime directly by supporting Doha and specific Doha initiatives. Um, but that doesn't seem to be working. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't seem to be really advancing the agenda. What can the G20 do on that subject uh, to really move the ball forward? I think the G20 actually did make a difference last year. On the, on the standstill, one of the dogs that didn't bark during the financial crisis was an advance of protectionism. And I think that the G20 meeting together, leaders looking each other in the eye and, and agreeing uh, that they would not uh, adopt beggar thy neighbor policies despite the pressures on, uh, on their economies was very important. More specifically on the WTO, there was an important uh, move uh, in the past couple of uh, G20s, which really crystallized last year, to um, narrow down on uh, a, a fresh, credible approach, was the way it was uh, worded, uh, focusing on trade facilitation as a way that, as a sort of win-win in the, in the uh, multilateral trading space. And an important, after the G20 met in September last year, that those sort of links and agreements were amongst the, the leaders were helpful in supporting uh, the Bali agreement in December last year. Now, there have been, there's some rockiness in terms of the implementation most recently of, uh, of that agreement. But the, if you look at the glass half full side of it, uh, what has become clear is that countries from, uh, you know, some in sub-Saharan Africa to many in Asia and elsewhere have really bought into the idea of trade facilitation, which sounds kind of dull maybe, but it's uh, extremely important to make it easier to trade goods across borders, to simplify, and, and IT of course helps now, 
to simplify uh, regulations, to uh, get rid of the system where a situation where you might have goods that perish whilst they're waiting to, to cross borders. And the, uh, the work that's analytical work suggests that there is a big GDP impact that can come from trade facilitation. And the G20 really has pushed that work forward. And I think that will continue even if, uh, you know, even as we work through uh, the other parts of the uh, Bali Agreement, um, which include financing for that. But we in the United States, for example, it was announced at the Africa Leaders <coughs> Summit, are going to uh, doing some work, which, which we're leading in the White House, to uh, focus our, uh, our aid money also on facilitating these sorts of, uh, this sort of integration, which is really important in many African countries. The other things that I think can happen on, on trade is, um, as you know, uh, my colleague and predecessor in my job, Michael Froman, has been working very hard to um, develop trade agreements that, uh, that look at the best parts of uh, the trading system. So that, uh, you know, as he likes to put it, we can work to raise standards in the global marketplace and to have a freer and fairer exchange of, uh, of goods with the protections for labor, for the environment, and, uh, and other important areas amongst important, although different, uh, countries of different size, sizes. And that is something that, that uh, began in APEC rather than in, the, as you know, rather than in the G20. But it's of interest also in the G20 as leaders talk about how they can support faster um, exports, as you know, are very important for jobs here, and how they can support faster growth, uh, of which trade is an important part. So it's that level of discussion. In a way, there's a similar discussion on climate the leaders don't get into the climate negotiations. They're not going to start negotiating about mitigation, adaptation. Uh, that's all done properly in the UN and the UNFCCC. But what the G20 leaders who account for, or whose economies generate 80% uh, of carbon emissions as well as 80% of GDP, um, can agree on specific steps that they take, whether it's around hydro fluorocarbons, which was HFCs, one issue last year, or raising the standards, emission standards in particular uh, for particular vehicles, or whether it's about giving a political push to the notion that their negotiators should remember that we have a goal that where we can all reach agreement that is mutually helpful. So, so I it's that political I, I want to ask you about, push. move on to another topic of financial regulation, but first on yes. climate, I can't resist. So the leaders are going to discuss climate in Brisbane, despite the fact that the host uh, is not enthusiastic about the subject, not to I, I'm raise sure a there will be many it. people around the table, and you know, you can talk about the climate and energy, energy efficiency, clean energy, they're, they're really all uh, related. And I'm glad you're going to talk about financial regulation, because that that is an area where there was a big effort, and I think that important progress has been made. Well, that's exactly perfect uh, segue into what I was going to ask David, because we've heard that from Mark Sobel, from others this morning, that there's been this great progress on financial regulation. It sort of felt like we're going to do a lip victory lap um, in, uh, in Brisbane. And that sounds appropriate on one level, because there has been tremendous progress, clearly. And yet your most recent, uh, the IMS Global Financial Stability Review, um, has highlighted some of these, and you mentioned them just now, um, sort of a continuing risks in the financial system and shadow banking and, and other things. And so, uh, you know, is, have we, is it a little too early is to the be declaring victory? Is the world should, safe for capitalism? Should, is it safe for capitalism? Should we be doing more? What should we be doing? And how okay. can the G20 contribute again? I think a very important round of financial and regulatory reform has been accomplished, and it makes sense in Brisbane to uh, highlight that, to celebrate that. Uh, when one looks at the steps that have been taken uh, and implemented in terms of uh, the uh, uh, capital standards and the various other standards, liquidity and leverage, uh, 
the recapitalization of banks, uh, all kinds of uh, cooperative efforts uh, across borders, um, the first round of work on uh, creating an, an approach to resolution that countries have signed on to. I mean, there, there's a whole host of things, a whole list of things. They, they should be celebrated in, uh, in Brisbane. Um, of course, what we are seeing in the world is that uh, once financial and regulatory reforms are in place, financial partic market participants react accordingly. And so banks are behaving in a way that is uh, safer and more cautious, which means that there are some things that they don't do anymore. Uh, because they don't, uh, it doesn't make business sense given the capital that they would have to hold against those. So some activities are migrating. They're migrating into the non-bank sector. And uh, we now have to look at the question of uh, whether the activities that are migrating are being done safely or not safely. We have to look at whether the financial and regulatory perimeter uh, needs to be extended. We have to look at the question of whether the, uh, that I mentioned earlier, of whether the very loose financial conditions that are necessary to try to stave off uh, disinflation uh, may be leading to risk taking in some parts of the, uh, of the financial system, either in the non-bank institutions or in uh, capital markets where corporations sell bonds, for example. Uh, we're looking at that. I think there are some risks. I think that uh, there's probably room for, uh, in, in some ways, for the regulatory perimeter to widen, for macroprudential tools that are presently used in banks to be extended to uh, uh, include uh, some, of, try to uh, affect the risk taking in uh, more, more generally. And, and uh, to make sure that uh, governments have the legal authority to do that. I think in, in, in the United States they do, in some countries they don't. Um, so there's more work to be done. Uh, and uh, we're, you know, we, we are trying to use our publications to uh, you know, uh, map out uh, what the, the uh, path ahead will, will look like. Okay, we're, I want to give the audience some time, but I want to ask you one question and then you a sort of a, a series of questions, which is the rest of the agenda, tax, and then the geopolitical issues and sort of mm -hmm. how you're going to handle that and anything else that we didn't talk about that you might want to talk about. But first, on the IMF quota reform yeah. question. Um, so I'm reminded when this, you know, you both said it, Mark Sobel said it earlier that this has to happen and one should, you know, maybe you didn't say it yet but that we hear a lot that, that the Senate really needs to do this to move forward and, 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 and pass this, uh, this relatively minor change to help support uh, uh, the IMF and the global uh, economic infrastructure. Um, uh, and it reminds me of Mark Twain talking about the weather, that everybody talks about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. So uh, what, um, you know, what, are, is there a risk here that you're just saying the same thing, that this has to be done, there's sort of a complacency setting in? I mean, is this a really important issue that you're working actively on? Should they, are they working actively on it? Should they, is there anything else that can be done to move this issue forward? Because it seems so critical to the credibility of your institution, of the G20, of the broader uh, global economic system, and it seems to be incentivizing countries that are unhappy with this, understandably, to do workarounds. I mean, I think of the BRICS Bank and even the Asian Infrastructure Bank in some sense as a consequence of our not having moved forward on this. So First, uh, after my uh, speech. Somebody um, is doing something me. about it. Caroline's doing something about it. <laughs> and we're expecting that she will succeed and hoping that. First, let's talk about why this is important. You know, the IMF was set up after um, World War II and with a, with a governance structure, which is a good governance structure, unlike the United Nations, where Antigua has the same vote in the General Assembly as the United States. and the IMF, there's a formula that tries to encapsulate uh, the economic uh, importance, uh, size and importance of countries and have the governance uh, structure reflect that. And it's, uh, it's a sensible approach. Uh, it's, now, uh, it, it's now outmoded in, in that the formula I haven't been capturing properly the growing size and importance of some of the emerging market countries. 
those countries need to feel as though they have uh, the, the right say in our institution for them to feel that this uh, is uh, the institution through which they can exert uh, influence over the management of the global economy and the, pr the protection of uh, global financial stability. So this is important. Um, and let me say that uh, Christine Lagarde and I spend a lot of time and energy trying to uh, get the last round of uh, uh, quota and governance reforms passed and dealing with the US government and talking to people in Congress to explain to them uh, uh, our system so that they have a good basis for voting. Um, I want to make the case, too, that this, the IMF is good for its members, good for the United States as much as its other members. And you know, if you think back, the IMF is, has been asked to deal with crisis after crisis, the Latin debt crisis, the transition country, the transition challenge in Eastern Europe, the Asian financial crisis, the global financial crisis. The IMF is asked to go and be, in a sense, first boots on the ground when there's a big mess, uh, such as the case of Ukraine. We lent Ukraine. We have a program with Ukraine that could uh, be uh, up to $17 billion of support for Ukraine when financial support is really not available for Ukraine anywhere else. Uh, we've been working with the Arab countries in transition. We've been pushing the Europeans to deal with their problems. The very first uh, speech that Christine Lagarde made when she came laid bare what, what uh, the IMF thought were the untended issues in Europe. And I think uh, as time has gone on, while they were re reluctant at first, the Europeans have admitted that those, in fact, are problems and have begun to deal with them. So we are, we are trying to make the world safe for uh, trade and investment that's good for America. Um, so I think there's every good reason for uh, Congress, if it understands the, the role we play, if it sees what we do to act and to, and, and to be supportive. Uh, it is genuinely a problem for our institution. I, my own view is that it's uh, a problem for the United States if the United States doesn't act in terms of the United States' ability to exert uh, economic leadership in the world. Uh, you know, we, we understand, and Caroline can speak to this, that the administration has uh, uh, mapped out how it will uh, go forward with Congress this fall after the, elect the midterm elections, and we hope that, uh, we, we really hope that that will be successful. Okay, thanks. Um, you can comment on that if you want, but um, tax, why is it so important, and is this agenda something that the U.S., we were asked earlier, um, both Mike Callahan and Mark Sobel highlighted the importance mm -hmm. of this tax agenda, which is a kind of an ad addition to the sort of core mm -hmm. issues that the G20 has been working on. Um, and somebody made the comment that the U.S. Congress may not be so enthusiastic, at least about the avoidance side, the evasion side, not so much probably a problem, but the question of some of these efforts to go after um, uh, corporate tax uh, avoidance uh, measures, and is that, uh, is that going to be a challenge in getting some progress in this area? Okay, let me just say briefly on IMF reform that, uh, that as I mentioned earlier, we do believe that it's in the interests of the United States, the economic and national security interests of the United States to have a strong, well-functioning uh, IMF, and we are certainly uh, working hard to uh, persuade others of that and to succeed in getting this uh, measure passed in Congress, in, which is just converting uh, a loan to the IMF into equity shares in the IMF. Uh, so that's why the money involved is uh, rather small. Um, on ta the tax agenda, I think this is an important one for, first of all, the tax evasion element has been a huge uh, success, including for the United States, because what we've essentially done uh, through the G20, first the G7 and then the G20, is uh, multilateralize a system that we began of automatic sharing of financial information. Uh, so more and more countries have signed up for that bilaterally and then with a similar system being agreed multilaterally. And that is very important because it helps to um, 
reduce corruption and to um, identify misused funds that are flowing through the financial system. And I think a couple of years ago, nobody imagined that we would, uh, that we would have that success. There were different measures being considered in Europe and so on. So that, it, on the evasion side, uh, I think that's been very important work. On the avoidance side, I don't see it so much as going after companies. Uh, we want to go after the kind of race to the bottom in tax incentives when countries offer special deals to companies if they, uh, if they headquarter in those jurisdictions. And uh, we also, we have a, a high statutory corporate tax rate in the United States, but we have a much lower effective rate of corporate tax because uh, corporations can keep income overseas. And <clears throat> that doesn't really make much sense. What we want to do, and we believe it's in our interests and, and the United States' interests, and ultimately in corporations' interests, is to focus, uh, to have corporate executives and others working to locate their production and their workforce where it makes economic sense and not where it makes tax sense. Uh, so it's a kind of diversion of effort to be um, trying to exploit, know about and exploit obscure tax regulations rather than figure out what is the best place with a skilled workforce, you know, strong rule of law, uh, proximity to natural resource, whatever it may be for different companies, they should really be taking those location decisions on the basis of what makes sense uh, for, for their production and sales and everything. And bringing this work into the G20 and with the OECD giving strong backing has been an important way to, uh, to progress the debate. Uh, where there was a bit of a debate about, well, uh, you know, companies go to a poor country in sub-Saharan Africa and then they do a bargain that, that the country there may be too, uh, may not have the resources to, the human resources to address. And the other side of that is that maybe in some countries the governance structure for uh, allowing companies to be there or the tax incentives may not be as clean as they might be. And if we're all working together to have clearer, cleaner, more transparent rules that don't offer inappropriate incentives, I think that's good for both sides of the equation. Okay. Um, I have uh, taken a lot of the time. I will forego asking about the geopolitical issues except to say that, you know, there are, as David uh, went through, a laundry list of some really challenging issues in the world from you know, Ukraine to the Middle East to Ebola to possibly Hong Kong. Um, and at, at a minimum, these things are distractions, but the leaders are gonna wanna talk about these things and uh, whether they're gonna wanna say anything about them in, a, in an economic forum is, is, is a question, but, um, but they, are, they are there and, and Sherpas have to deal with them. So I just make that comment and they can comment on that in, in uh, the Q&A with the audience if, if, if they would like, but I would like to give people on the floor a chance to ask questions. If you do have a question, raise your hand, wait for the microphone, identify yourself, and please try to ask a question. There was a lady in the back there. Hello, Verity Linehan from the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, my question is to you, Ms. Atkinson. So you discussed the G20 standstill agreement to fight protectionism. Do you see this agreement as a success given that since October 2008, over, two, over 1,000 new trade measures have been introduced by the G20, only about 250 of those have been removed, and that of these, import restrictive me measures are estimated to account for around 4% of world merchandise imports and are about 5% of G20 country member imports? However, obviously the alternative is if it hadn't been in place, it could be much worse. Following on from this, do you think the G20 will put further emphasis on removing these trade measures in the future? Thank you. There, I suspect that some of the measures are ones that are WTO compliant, uh, but so that maybe, uh, that maybe would affect the numbers. But I think I would go to the second part of your, of your question, that the, uh, 
commitment amongst the G20 to avoid protectionism, I think, has been an important signal and an important sort of guide of policy. Uh, most analysts will agree that, as I said, it was the dog that didn't bark. There has not been, uh, you know, the trading system has remained largely open. There has even been progress uh, since the global financial crisis in opening up some markets more, uh, whether on a plurilateral, bilateral, regional basis. And I think that's uh, been a very important part of the, of the debate and the discussion in the G20. OK. Uh, yes, sir, also in the back there. Thank you. Brad Smith with the American Council of Life Insurers. Um, can I ask, uh, do you, as the, in your opinion, especially Ms. Atkinson, um, is there a, a recognition of the correlation between uh, financial regulation and the standards being set on uh, specifically pension and insurance companies um, that disincentivizes them from investing in long-term assets such as infrastructure and the disconnect with the objective of the G20 to increase private financing for infrastructure. Thank you. No. That's an, an interesting question, and I think David kind of referred a little bit to it. We know that, uh, I haven't heard about it so much in the context, we're interested to hear from you, and maybe we can discuss afterwards about the long-term uh, investors, pensions, and life insurers. Uh, certainly, as, as one is considering how to strengthen the financial system, and wanting financial institutions to hold more capital to make them uh, stronger and less likely to need uh, taxpayer support going forward, uh, that's going to have some impact on risk judgments and lending behavior. I think that uh, looking at that will be another sort of phase um, in the future. In the meantime, what we've been doing very much in the work on infrastructure and investment more generally is seeing where are the places that uh, governments can help either with some, you know, we have the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, OPIC, there are similar development finance institutions in other uh, countries. There are the multilateral development banks often have uh, a way of co-financing and guaranteeing There's the IFC. So there are ways that the public sector can take some portion of risk uh, to support the provision of longer term funding by institutions that have long term capital or that have long term assets that um, uh, such as uh, are looking for long term assets such as pensions and, and life insurers. And David, David you want to talk about that? Just to say, I, I presume that what you're referring to is uh, solvency two, which is in essence you all should think about as the it's like the Basel three agreement for banks, it's, a, uh, it's an agreement on how uh, uh, regulations will be applied in the cases of insurance, uh, the insurance industry. I think it is important that financial, large financial institutions, especially those that could be uh, systemically significant, how they are uh, regulated so we don't have a repeat crisis, we, whether it's banks, pension funds and insurance companies or the shadow, the shadow banks, we do have to ask ourselves how the regulations that we're putting in place affect financial intermediation. Are there things that will no longer be done? Are there things that will migrate someplace else and be done safely, be done unsafely? I think that's the bigger question. Clearly, in the area of infrastructure, we, do, we don't want to see a repeat of what we saw before the crisis, where Banks create structures that get seven day to 28 day money from money market funds and turn it into 10 year loans in structures that if they collapse end up uh, being uh, the, the taxpayer's problem. Uh, we want to see uh, long term uh, funds uh, like the kind of funding that insurance companies and pension funds have supporting long term projects that require long term lending. There should be a way to do that. I think that's, in a sense, the post-Brisbane agenda, is to figure out how to make sure that uh, financial intermediation really safely serves the 
the real economy. Okay, Mike. Sorry, right here. Thank you, Mike Monder, former U.S. Treasury and XG7 Group. Um, could you both answer, please, the uh, or try to answer the comment by Professor Mankiw of Harvard that the IMF and presumably the G20 by extension seems to have a, a free lunch view of infrastructure spending that's sort of akin to a Republican view of tax cuts. Um, and, and secondly, um, page one of the WIO says that advanced economies are, will be required to maintain monetary policy and fiscal adjustments that are in tune with supporting both the recovery and long-term growth. Could you perhaps give some substance to those words? Okay, David. Um, I would note that everybody did get a free lunch today, so there is such a thing <laughs> as a free no, lunch. No, it wasn't so, so free because they could have had lunch down That's the street. That's true. They you have to do the opportunity cost. Uh, look, Mike, um, you know, Larry Summers wrote uh, in the FT yesterday that it is a free lunch, so maybe we'll let Larry and Greg, who are colleagues, uh, duke this out at a theoretical level. But I think it's, there's a basic, a very basic proposition here that um, when the basic, there are basically two propositions here. One, not that it's a free lunch, that it's a good investment. If infrastructure actually uh, leads to a social return, whether it's the school in which your child learns, or the highway on which you drive, or the port through which your goods come, it has a return. Uh, there is the, and that's there all the time, and so if, if our infrastructure you know full well if our infrastructure crumbles, we have a, a negative rate of return. There's, there's a bridge up here on Route 95 on the way to Philadelphia that they're going to take a year to, to fix it. And so now you have to drive through Wilmington. So not having done the maintenance has a cost. Imagine if the, if the um, Bay Bridge had to be closed for a year, the costs for people going around. So you know, maintaining the public capital stock is an important thing. Then there's the second part, which is what you might call the Keynesian part, which is if a lot of people are unemployed and doing nothing, or even worse, requiring support from the budget for uh, their period of unemployment. Uh, it is, there is the Keynesian free lunch that if you put them to work, the, uh, the economy will uh, be larger. Now, I say all that, I don't want to minimize that it is possible that people pick projects poorly, and so there is no rate of return. It's possible that people in some places, money is stolen. Uh, it's, you know, it, it, it's not to suggest that infrastructure is always good, but take a look at our study. We look at the actual experience of countries, taking into account that there are inefficiencies. We point out where the, where the efficiencies are greater and less but that as a general matter, uh, over 30 years, uh, the inf infrastructure has brought a return, and when it's done in a situation where there's slack, the, uh, the effect on output is larger and more uh, sustained. And uh, you know, without characterizing it as a free lunch, which I wouldn't do, I think that the case for looking situation by situation, country by country, to see whether there's an infrastructure need, whether countries could benefit. I think that makes sense. OK, Jeff. Thanks. Hi, I'm Jeff Hardy with the International Chamber of Commerce. Uh, quick question near the end. Uh, Matt Goodman, CSIS, in his own column has, you know, Question the relevancy of the G20 as it moves away from climate or from crisis mode. And in your remarks, uh, Caroline, earlier, I would agree with you that this decision on the standstill agreement and the one or two little lines that you had in the last communique on the commitment to the TFA were massively significant. Uh, collective decisions by the G20 um, that really just materialized themselves in a line or two. Um, so my question, since this needs to be a question, is 
Can we expect to see the G20 to take those types of leadership steps in the future communiques? And for example, you talked about engaging on climate, continuing to gauge, you know, to show leadership at WTO. So oh, hold on one second. Let me let me take two more questions because we don't have a lot of time. There was a lady there from the Heinrich Boll Foundation, I remember, and that lady there. Yeah, Nancy Alexander from Heinrich Boll, just pushing the question on infrastructure a bit further. There were a lot of attachments to the communique from Cairns a couple of weeks ago, and. They were endorsing the whole idea of taking a pooled funds approach to portfolios of PPPs in countries and regions. And is this a, um, is this a policy position that you as US government representatives or that the G20 as a whole um, is pursuing as a way, as you said, Mr. Lipton, to solve this question of financial intermediation. Um, if I understood you correctly, you all, you said earlier that you um, thought we should step back from what I understood to be uh, an excessive uh, enthusiasm for PPPs and certainly given the demonstrated high failure rates, especially in the area of public goods, water and electricity, um, those are pronounced uh, failures, and so it's important to understand whether, in fact, this pooled fund approach to portfolios of PPPs will go forward, and if so, uh, what kinds of guidelines would be applied? Okay, and one more question over there, the lady at the, uh, yep. Thank you. Jen Riccardi from the Embassy of Luxembourg. Um, Ms. Atkinson, since you mentioned Ambassador Froman's efforts to negotiate these gold standard trade agreements, I was hoping you could update us on the White House's view of the status of those negotiations. Uh, I, I, oh, you understood the question. I, okay, good. You want to do the trade ones? <coughs> those were all for um, Well, you can do some infrastructure. I'll, I'll do an overall thing. So on the trade negotiations, the uh, you know we continue to make progress, and there are usually fairly um, and the White House view is that it's important to uh, continue to work to make sure that we are um, going to have trade agreements that are in the interests of, uh, of the American workers and businesses and farmers and that promote growth and jobs in our economy. And that is what Ambassador Froman is traveling around the world to try to make happen. Um, and then, of course, we would have important discussions with, uh, with Congress, and that's critical. Um, and these things just take time. So I don't want to, you know, there's no, there's, there's a rhythm and a timing to uh, these negotiations, and, and, and there's clearly, um, they're, they're still, and continuing. Um, on the uh, issue of the, thanks for your nice comments about the communique, of course we try and I'm sure leaders will want to uh, seek agreement on some particular things and you're right that sometimes there can be a small line uh, and particular people will notice particular lines. I mean another line that, uh, that was important in one context last year was uh, about um, support for countries meeting their WHO, uh, International Health Regulations, IHR, and we gave a push to that, which was a forerunner of the global health security agenda, which of course has got much more attention right now with the Ebola outbreak, but uh, even before that, last year, Margaret Chan re remarked to a colleague of mine that having that sentence in the G20 was very important for her as she was encouraging com countries to join. And last year, we also had a, a sentence about uh, worker safety in, in the workplace. So there are different areas where we certainly try to get the collective weight of G20 leaders. Uh, on Nancy's question, maybe, uh, David can answer about infrastructure funds. I think that, as David said, there are 
infrastructure investment can be a very good investment, a good social investment, and a good private investment. And it's important to you know, pick the right projects and have an appropriate kind of financing for those projects. Yeah, I didn't mean to say more than that uh, there are going to be some, there's going to be a, a, a set of projects that make sense to do. Some should probably be done by the public sector. Some can be done through public-private partnerships. Some can be done privately. And it, it, it's worth being clear about the uh, objectives, the, the nature of the good, whether it's a public good or not, and whether and how it's best to finance and charge. I don't have a view about the particular financial engineering of the, of the pools, but to say quality control is very important. It can become very political. Uh, the, there used to be uh, a lot of cost-benefit analysis done at the World Bank to help countries, uh, developing countries, assess whether projects made sense or not, and that's a bit of a lost art. Um, you know that in this country, the selection of infrastructure can be uh, very political. It, every country will have to figure out it in its own way how to have a process, social and political process, where people are comfortable with the selection because the, the, a lot of money is being dedicated uh, to, uh, to these projects that have very long-term uh, long consequences. Great. Well, look, we, we need a lot more time, but these two, time is precious, and I really appreciate it. They, they definitely paid for their lunch uh, today, so, <laughs> so they didn't get a free lunch. But uh, please join me in thanking David and Caroline for their contributions today. And, uh, and I, I, I do commend to you some of the written product that has been alluded to in this session, including the communiques, which we really do need to read because they're actually, some of it gets a little dense and wordy, but, but it's actually got important stuff. And what the IMF is putting out, the, 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 the WIO, that chapter on infrastructure, the, uh, the financial stability review, really rich stuff, and I, I recommend reading it uh, in your spare time. Thank you all for, uh, for coming.